Welcome to This Week in BJJ, the only show running the gamut of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and running it live every Friday night. Hello and welcome to a new edition of This Week in BJJ. I'm Budo Jake and today is July 27th, 2012. I want to remind you guys that we have a chat room. If you want to join in the chat, select uh, your name below the video player on budovideos.com. And if you have any news that you want to send to us, the email address is twibjj at budovideos.com. And lastly, if you are kind enough to leave us a review on iTunes or YouTube, if you enjoy the show, we'd appreciate that as well. Also joined, as usual, with Budo Dane. Had some hard training this week? Yeah, I, I trained pretty hard this week. Um, I was sick Monday, so I felt like I had to come back with a vengeance, and so I did. <laughs> and my face paid the price. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> and special guest tonight, we got AJ Agazarm. AJ, thanks for coming in today. My pleasure, guys. So you got some scratches on your face, too. Yeah, a couple, uh, couple scratches, a little bit of a fat lip. Is that from uh, your training partners or your girls? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably both. <laughs> and you had a birthday yesterday. I did. Is that you uh, 21 now? you able to drink? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Despite my looks, I just turned 25. 25. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Nice. How'd you spend the day? Spent it with Kyron and the crew. We had a lot of fun, and then later in the day, we uh, went to the school and, and taught classes. And that would uh, that couldn't be more rewarding in right. itself. I had two Yellow Belt students that got promoted that day, and uh, they actually drew a picture for me. Oh, that's which awesome. Which pretty cool, yeah. Sweet. So on your Facebook, you posted you wanted your uh, you wanted your birthday cake to be acai. <laughs> did it? Did it? Did they deliver? Oh yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's one thing that guys who train usually don't want is birthday yeah. cake. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, before we get too much into it, I'd like to remind you that if there's anything you'd like to submit to us, email address is twibjj at budovideos.com, and uh, you can also join us in the chat room. Just below the video player on Budo Videos, uh, you can just choose your name. And if you have any questions for us, feel free to ask us in the chat. Also, I'd like to ask you to leave us a review on iTunes or YouTube if you enjoy the show. So our guest today is AJ. For guys that don't know, you are uh, an avid competitor in the Team Gracie Baja. And you moved around a lot. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, I, I certainly moved around a lot. I, I started um, actually making a long story longer. I had originally first went to college to wrestle at a small NAI school in Kentucky called University of the Cumberlands, and I spent a year and a half there. Um, I actually got into a little bit of MMA, mixed martial arts, and cage fighting there with one of my teammates, and on a whim, at the uh, at the event center, they actually signed me up to do a, an amateur cage fight. I took the cage fight, told my uh, good friend about it. And uh, he said, there's a Gracie Baja, there's a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu school that's in Clearwater in our area, and uh, you should train there during the summer. I said, yeah, we'll be fine. I'll check it out. He called up Eduardo, who is Eduardo de Lima, my head instructor, and he said, I have a wrestler here who wants to train with you over the summer. He, Eduardo sort of laughed and, ha, 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 bring the wrestler to me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, from there, I just trained three months in the summer. Uh, surprisingly got my blue belt very fast from in three months was awarded my blue belt and then I went back to college for that that second uh, semester and in that time uh, Master Carlos had asked me to kind of you know, put my education on hold and travel to Brazil and uh, stay with him and his family and, and earn my black belt there um, you know I, I said man I, I, I am so happy that you would offer me such a I know an awesome opportunity I had to kindly decline and say hopefully there can be an, another time um, due to wanting to really just capitalize on getting my education secured prior to doing anything in terms of the mixed martial arts world or MMA world. So I actually, instead of going to Brazil, instead of staying at the college that I was at, I packed bags up and shipped over to Ohio State, walked on the wrestling team, and um, finished my undergrad there. Was it the wrestling team that attracted you to that college? Yep. Oh, yeah. The wrestling team and the head coach, Tom Ryan. He's a phenomenal coach, and just um, it was an incredible experience. It hurt my jiu-jitsu game a lot um, prior to uh, – there was a little bit of a time frame there between when I went to um, Ohio State and when I was back home in Florida. I stayed a little bit, I think like six or seven months just training jiu-jitsu, and um, I had just finished the Pan Ams and did really well at the Pan Ams. Uh, there at the Blue Belt, and right before Worlds, I had moved to Ohio State, and I thought, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do the Worlds. There's nowhere to train. 
I found a Helsing Gracie Academy there. The guys were very welcoming and, um, you know, tried to put politics aside for a little bit there and said, you know, just come train with us. There was a strength and conditioning gym that I trained at um, for a good, good couple months and uh, it paid off, you know, not having to be at my school, not being able to be at my school where I had originated from and venturing off to another school with new guys and kind of adapting to what they were doing. Um, competed again in the in the Mundials, did really well there, and um, then my jiu-jitsu took a, a holding pattern. <laughs> the slumps. Right. <laughs> so this was before you, you started wrestling in college? Or before you went, you were wrestling for Ohio State? Before, prior to Ohio okay. State, yep. And then that's when I said the holding pattern was then I moved into Ohio State and started wrestling there. I was actually working a full-time job, 40 hours at Chase and um, Chase Bank and um, pretty keeping keeping pretty busy. It's actually a, it's a funny story because in order to get into Ohio State, I had to take 25 credit hours, three quarters in a row, uh, to be able to get accepted and, and be in the program. So it was a pretty daunting summer. Wow. <laughs> right, I bet. Most, most students take probably about 12 and a half hours per quarter. Yeah, 15 was the most I ever took. Yeah. So I had to take 25 plus a 40-hour work week <sighs> and finding time to train. Wow. <laughs> Surprised you get burned out. Yeah. It was all uh, it was all for a, an end goal, I guess. Right. For a guy that's done a lot of wrestling and jiu-jitsu, what do you think is the best thing about wrestling that jiu-jitsu doesn't have? That's a good question. Uh, wrestling is very, very super intense and... Uh, there's a lot of in your face shouting constantly you know critiquing certain positions drilling positions a million times and jujitsu is more i think in terms of it's just exactly what it means the gentle art it's not high intensity depending where you go and depending where you train um, i think that's just the one component that a lot of gyms are trying to you know Im impose on their schools to kind of amp it up a little bit and i'm finding that a little bit more and more as you know, jujitsu starts to grow as people are want to be more intense. They want to have intense practices, different from what they have standard classes that are looking like. And um, I think it's a it's a great addition to it. But at the same time, I don't think it's it's totally necessary to be as as intense as what wrestling is. Mm -hmm. Wrestling is a lot about you know strength for strength, and jujitsu is different. Jujitsu is a gentle art. It's it's exciting. <laughs> Do you think jiu-jitsu guys should drill as much as wrestlers do? I personally think so. I personally think drilling is, and that's one of the things that my instructor kind of imposed on me is drill, 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 drill till it's, you know, you don't even think about it. And that's one of the things that wrestling has taught me. So it was really easy for me to adapt to it. I'd do probably a thousand triangles in one practice and a thousand scissor sweeps in one practice, and that's when it just becomes muscle memory. Yeah. And it's... uh certainly rewarding in a tournament when you can just hit a move off of just f certain feeling. Your coach, Eduardo Lima, r really impressed me. I saw him for the first time at, I think it was the Worlds of the Pans camp at Gracie Baja this year, mm -hmm. and uh, just seemed like a really good leader, perfect English, perfect Portuguese, able to translate for, uh, for Zeha Giola. Yeah. Uh, what's his background? Man, I, I can't say enough good things about Eduardo, and I was, to be... You know, I, I've seen a lot of wrestlers go through the, the program into jiu-jitsu and try and skip over to it and make a switch to it. And I've seen a lot of wrestlers have a lot of struggle with it in terms of, you know, and adapting to the technique, adapting to the sensibility of the, the sport. Eduardo, he is so, so perfect in terms of being an instructor. It 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 elevated me completely. And, I, and to have somebody like that at, at the level that I was at, um, and the level I am today, it's just his background is, I, I think, just personality. He has an incredible personality. He, he knows a lot about jiu-jitsu. Him and Zay Hajiola are cut from the same cloth. Did, did he train with, with Zay? I'm not sure if they train. I know they're good friends. I don't know if they train together. Um, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe we have some guys in the chat that, that know that, but I, I wouldn't know that. I'm sure I have a couple guys back home that would know. <laughs> right. Um, but he uh, he knows a lot. He was the first... Um, Gracie Baja guy over to the United States. Was he? Yep. He uh, and went straight to Florida? Went straight to Florida and he he started in a garage and then went from a garage to a warehouse and he's been in the warehouse ever since. And it's uh it's pretty hot there. It's Florida. 
right so uh it's exciting when we train we're sweating pretty bad and um but man he just he keeps it exciting he keeps us always learning his biggest thing is there's details for every single little thing and every little detail makes a big difference it's just like anything else you know the little things make the big things yeah and that's kind of what he he stresses in his classes is paying attention to the little details what does he do to, to highlight the details that matter his voice <laughs> oh really <laughs> it's intimidating at first but uh when you start to get to know him you know he's just a fun loving guy and he's awesome to be around he knows a lot he's a history buff he knows a lot about history and he always has amazing stories to tell he's uh an adventurer his favorite character i think is alexander the great mm. Mm. and uh you know, he's he's taken me under his wing and kind of brought me into the jujitsu world and it's taken my life in a totally different route that i never would have even been expected and it's been amazing ever since so so now where do you see yourself as far as wrestling and jiu-jitsu which one has more of a hold on your life <laughs> <laughs> i get this question asked a lot and uh i always you know i'm a big big fan of, of knowing your roots and wrestling was my roots i'm still in re involved in wrestling i have a younger brother who's 16 years old and um man i when i coach him it's i coach his high school wrestling team and it's it's amazing to kind of just be in that that role and and teaching as to, as opposed to where I was when I was 16 and um, it's just it's two different sports but similar mindset. Now that you're living in California, who are you living with? <laughs> <laughs> I'm living with the master Carlos Gracie himself. He actually just uh, took off to Brazil two days ago, uh, so it's me and Kyron Gracie and uh, a couple other guys all in one house. Right. I've known Carly Niels for a long time, and yeah. I think he's a great guy, and I think he's he's a legend that is not very well known. A lot of people only know him as being a businessman, but he's such an inc incredibly enthusiastic and talented guy. I'm sure you have a lot of stories about living with him. Yeah, I have a lot of stories, and just to touch on that little piece and and that that you just said, Master Carlos likes to fly under the radar. He yeah. he doesn't want his name to be brought up. He doesn't. He he told me he's like he doesn't even want to go to fights. You know, guys have asked him to be in his corner for fights. He he doesn't want to be involved in that. You know, he just he wants to be the back on the back burner behind the scenes. You know, just the kind of the brains behind the operation. Yeah, if, if you want to find him at a tournament at the Worlds of the Pan, look at up the highest point and he'll be up there right. in the far <laughs> corner. We yeah. were at the last Worlds, right? We saw him in one of the offices overlooking the mats as opposed to, you know, like front and center, which yeah. some, which some people expect him to be. How did your living situation um, come about with Master Carlos? And they had asked me to uh, kind of come in and, and and help out with Kyron's school, and Kyron has a phenomenal school over in Mission Viejo, and um, they had asked me when I was here for the training camp in Pan Am, so they are like, AJ, what do you think about staying with us and, you know, training here and living here with us? and and helping out with the school, and I said, man, that'd be awesome. Couldn't couldn't think of a better scenario. <laughs> right. But uh, so many stories, so many wonderful stories is that's, you know, taking place. We've, uh, me and Master Carlos, been to Thousand Step Beach a lot. It's over there in Laguna Beach, and uh, he's so funny. He uh, he hates the sun. He, you know, has this thing about, you know, maybe skin cancer or something like that so he has to always be covered up he has a big floppy hat that sits on his head to keep him from the sun he has you know shirt and so when we're doing that he doesn't want to you know have any sun that's touching him or when we're driving he has two two hats that are on his knees just in case the sun's coming through the window <laughs> <laughs> but he's a character and uh utmost respect for the guy he's he's done a phenomenal job with Gracie Baja and and you know the the direction of the sport and just it just talking with him about so many different things and so many different scenarios he's just he has such a he thinks big in every single situation and i think that's the kind of thing that jujitsu really needs is the big picture a lot of you know gym owners and people are thinking immediate thoughts and it's been a it's been a lot of interesting con conversation i bet i bet makes you wonder about jujitsu right if it you know his his lifelong Involvement with jiu-jitsu has, has conditioned him to think two steps ahead of where he's at nearly every situation, life, mat, wherever it be. Sure. Yeah, I could imagine that being the case. He, um still a force on the mat, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Had the opportunity to roll with him a couple times, and he doesn't give you an inch. No. <laughs> <laughs> no a lot of pressure. He doesn't give you an inch. Yeah. And he's, he's, he's living life. He, he, 
he knows how to live life really well and and uh you know hats off to a guy that you know that can do that and impress upon others to do the same thing and i think that's one of his biggest messages is just you know live a life that you love yeah. and if you don't you're, you're wasting your time yeah seems like you prefer for the hats to be on <laughs> <laughs> yeah so today the olympics start it so started the uh, opening ceremony is going on as we speak yeah you guys looking forward to watching any of it I'm re I'm actually looking forward to watching the the wrestling and the swimming edition of it. The wrestling mainly because I had a few guys that were, you know, we have a, a training center, Olympic training center that was out of Ohio State. Probably had four or five guys that were making a run for it, and uh, they were Olympic hopefuls. One of the guys out of our camp actually ended up making it, so mm. it's going to be exciting to watch him. His name's Trebel. Uh, I really don't know how to pronounce his last name just because it's super tough. So if I butcher it, Trebel, you know, forgive me. It's Trebel Dervlangoviv. I don't even know. Speaking of which, w w what nationality is your last name? Armenian. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. It used to be, probably a few generations ago, Ar Agazarmian, mm. and they dropped the I-A-N off, and now it's just Agazarm. All right. So one thing interesting about the Olympics is it comes around only every four years, so you get to see a lot of technological advances. This year, every Olympic sport is going to be live on YouTube. Wow. That's a really smart that's idea. That's incredible. Which that's something I realized living in Japan is that you would see totally different sports on Japanese TV than you would see here. You would see judo all day long there, whereas here you'd get probably nothing. Or right. maybe, maybe at midnight you might get five minutes of it. So it's fascinating to be able to see every minute of every event. Yeah, and for them to be able to harness the, the power of YouTube is incredible. Yeah. Especially for an, for an organization as big as the IOC, right? Yeah. Because you know? I remember... Not last Olympics, but the Olympics before that. I wanted to watch the judo matches because I just started jujitsu and dates me. And uh, I remember like waking up at four o'clock in the morning to watch it, and it was tennis or something. <laughs> and they just had the listings wrong. I'm like, oh, tennis is fun. What's wrong with tennis? No, it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but if you're expecting judo, and all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> I'm like no. <laughs> so you plan to watch any of it this year? Judo. I would, would like to pick up judo and the wrestling mm -hmm. and yeah. swimming because this is Phelps' last run, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's history, right? Yeah. That's one of the reasons I was looking forward to the uh, the swimming right. um, side of it was because mainly because of Phelps. Right. But tennis is, I think tennis is exciting to watch. No, it's an awesome sport. Yeah. But Even if you're not into the sport, just the grandeur of the event mm -hmm. is, yeah. is fun to watch. Could you imagine going to the opening ceremony? Oh, man. Yeah. It's, inc <laughs> it's incredible. I heard some, I heard something where there's like, not even the athletes. There were just 10,000 performers Wow, in mm -hmm. the stadium just for the opening ceremony. And there's like 16,000 athletes and then another like 30,000 or 40,000 in the stands. Wow. Now, I heard there was a big debacle on the, the clothing of the athletes. I guess it was all made in China. Oh, right. Uh, and the clothes. And, and was that situated? I don't I, I can't remember. But what do you expect? <laughs> Isn't everything made in China? <laughs> they made a big stink about it. And I heard a big stink about the uh, North Koreans are getting ready to play soccer. And they showed the flags on the screen. They showed the South Korean flag. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the North Koreans went out. I can't remember the athlete, but I know there was an athlete that actually got um, banned from the Olympics that had made the Olympics based on a, on a tweet. I think she had sent some sort of tweet. Oh, yeah, a Greek tweet. lady. Yeah. A oh, Greek. the triple jumper, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah that was pretty odd. Yeah. Well, apparently she was the a member of a really, like, really, f really uh, loud fringe party in Greece. And I see. Is more of who Greece wanted to represent them as opposed to, I think, the IOC saying you have to be out. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, let's get to some of the news this week. Uh, last Sunday, I went to a Jeff Glover seminar. You ever train with Jeff? I've never trained with Jeff. Such an awesome guy. So playful. I was uh, s tweeting out some of his uh, quotes during the seminar. One, <laughs> one thing he said was, I don't do Brazilian jiu-jitsu anymore. I do play jujitsu, <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what he does. He, you know, he doesn't care about points. He just looks so playful, but yeah. he's, he's got the techniques. Um, I noticed that when we had the expo. Yeah, and it was right. fun to watch him when he beat Kyle. Yeah, yeah, and he actually showed how he beat Kyle in the seminar. <laughs> that, that was fascinating. Uh, we got a little clip from uh, the seminar. Let's take a look here. This is a drill just to get warmed up and this is uh, setting up his uh, his seven year choke why does he call it the seven year choke because he learned it from a seven year old kid <laughs> 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 and it's a pretty cool choke 
pulled it off in sparring myself last night. There's a 50 50 uh, sweep. Oh, very nice. I've been playing a lot with the 50 50 lately. Mm -hmm. There's actually a lot there, right? Yeah. And what's the story behind the white belt? He forgot his black belt. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't care. So that was a really cool seminar. If you ever get a chance, highly recommend his seminars. He seems like a good guy. Yeah. So, I mean, with the play jiu jitsu thing, AJ, have. Have things for you, like techniques or, or things that you've worked on, ever come from just, you know, playing and throwing techniques out there? Or is, or is it all very directed for you? No, that's a, that's a great question, actually, because that is where I am at in terms of my 50-50 right now. I've just been playing with it, having fun with it, and just been kind of exposing some new things with it. And um, I think the biggest thing for me with 50-50 is just the guys that really like to play it, I just want to diffuse it, and I want to take it away. Um, I, I don't want to get stuck in a four minute five minute battle on the mat with both of our legs locked i just want to you know let's let's keep the action going sort of thing so i was just kind of playing with that a little bit the last couple months and um you can call that play jujitsu right right <laughs> was it something that's very specifically where you're like i need to defeat this where you're like let's play with this let's see what's there yeah it was more along the lines of let's let's play with this a little bit and you know having you know brains like kyron <laughs> gracie in there and kind of just looking at it from different angles we kind of Came up with a few exciting things that I'll probably release um, for the Nogi Pan Ams. Mm. So that you're gonna be your next tournament? Yes. Oh, actually, I had a signed up for the Vegas Open, and there was a competitor that I was hoping to see there sign up, but he didn't, so I pulled out. And now I'm going to be doing the Samurai Pro. Mm. That when is when's going to be in Carson. When's the Samurai Pro again? The same weekend of, of the Vegas Open. Oh, cool. Is he gonna be there? I don't know. Oh. The only reason why I like the Samurai Pro is there's an absolute prize of a thousand for brown belts. Oh, okay, which is so nice, right? Yeah, it will be exciting. I think when when people have see a you know a thousand dollar prize or an X amount of dollars for a prize, the competitors are are going to be a lot more intense, and that's really what I'm looking for is the you know the the registration for the Vegas Open. There was one other opponent in my weight, and I really didn't want to fly there just for a single opponent, which you know seemed like it would be a little bit more exciting to go to the Samurai Pro. Right. So. So, Jake, you had another quote. I mean, and I'm going to paraphrase here because there's a not nice word in it, but he said that you have to make jiu-jitsu your own. Mm -hmm. You know, that that you can't just try and, you know, I guess his point was you can't just try and take techniques wholesale and just block them up in your memory. That you Yeah, at the seminar, Jeff said uh, you shouldn't be trying to copy other people's jiu-jitsu. You should try to make it your own. And so... Th Throughout the seminar, he was saying, I'm not here to teach you techniques. I'm trying to teach you ways to think about positions and so you can make up your own stuff. Oh, that makes I, sense. I thought that was a really good uh, way of thinking. Because oftentimes, we, we all, we're all going to do the same technique different. Right. I mean, everybody has their own little adjustments, right? Yeah. And there's a f there are fundamentals that kind of just are no-brainers that you don't kind of play with the fundamentals and the way things work certain right. sp specific ways. But... Yeah, there are a lot of if positions that can really just be played with and kind of expanded upon, and 50-50 is one of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Speaking of the devil, right? <laughs> so on Monday, I was, um, well, Monday night I was asleep, right. but you, Jake, headed out to the Mendes Brothers Academy. Yep, we were supposed to go together. I was, I was bummed that you couldn't make it. Yeah, I woke up feeling horrible. I heard, I, I... S I've seen from pictures and I've heard from individuals that the facility looks amazing. Yeah, it looks like an art gallery. Yeah. You know, it's solid white. Um, you have to wear a white gi to really? train there. Uh, but it's a beautiful place and what incredible teachers they are. Yeah. yeah. Which, which I was going to ask you, I mean, we went, we went to their seminar and it's probably one of the best seminars I went to. And I, and I joke, but I mean it. I probably forgot more than I absorbed. <laughs> you know, it's one of those ones where at the end of the seminar, I was just sitting there, you know, in, sitting Indian style thinking, oh God. Like furiously taking down notes and almost feeling it leak out of my ear, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, wh what did they show, and, and how was the how was the teaching? Was it did it live up to the seminar? Or? Yeah. Um, before I answer that, one of the guys that went with me, <laughs> he said that after the class was over, he went out to his car, wrote down no less than three pages of notes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, so I had, yeah. That's the amount mm -hmm. of detail that they give. One of the things that I kind of stress upon when I teach seminars and and do privates is when I teach something, you know. Apply it immediately the week after. Apply it immediately the day after in your game. And it's it, if it's not only going to, you know, help you to keep that in your game, but it's going to shed some light on what was talked about, and you'll kind of put the pictures with the with right. the words and 
put everything together on your own. For sure. Some guys, they learn techniques and they learn moves and they don't apply it. They just, they're like, oh, that was awesome. And then they just forget it. Right. And that's one of the things I learned from Hodger Gracie is just doing a few with him. And it's just, as soon as I teach you something, just apply it right away. And, and the same thing happened when I was with Eduardo. He'd, I'd, he'd show me a move and we'd go to live sparring and it just do that only in this in live sparring. Why? Right. Because you're, you're going to learn it better. Right. I think a lot of people try what they just learned and it doesn't work and they think, ah, forget it. It doesn't yeah. work for me. But you got to fail and fail and fail again until it works, right? And that's kind of where Glover's perspective comes into play is just keep playing with it. Yeah. Right, and I think that changes the mindset a little bit as opposed to, oh, this thing isn't working with me, but it's more like, you know, a toy. Let me play with this until I can figure out, you know, yeah. what to do with it, how it works for me, what I can, how I can make it work. If you think about jujitsu from where it, when it started, I'm sure that's pretty similar to what was going on there. Yeah. So it's... Uh, well, the story of Helio, right? He's probably yeah. trying these techniques and it didn't work. And then, so what did he do? Yeah. <laughs> Started playing. Yeah. To make it work. As far as what the Mendes brothers showed, it was all... It wasn't just a random batch of techniques. It was all reverse De La Hiva passes. And they all started with the same grip, which I thought was an interesting way of teaching. You start with the same grip and your pass changes based on what your opponent does. Mm. So I've never been to a class before where everything in the class was starting with the same grip. So that was interesting. That's a really clever approach. And you get both of them. You know, both brothers were teaching, so they'd all come around. Right, sure. So, yeah, incredible class. So it must have almost felt like drilling because it's like you're starting from the same situation and just hit it, hit it, hit it, yeah. right? Yeah. That's cool. Seems, I mean, I imagine that's a lot of what you guys do in wrestling, right? Yeah, same same position, different scenarios. Right. Oh, so you guys would like you, a lot of times. You guys would get a like get, get in a posi uh, specific position and then just you know hit the different scenarios. Yeah, maybe a for example would be a single leg. Say for example, we will have a single leg and maybe finishing in a different way, right. um, depending on how he reacts. So similar, similar kind of theory there. Right. Cool. Dane, what do you think of this uh, Canadian beer that we just cracked open? It's a little lighter. It's <laughs> really light, <laughs> especially coming from the <laughs> the dark. The dark, yeah. Kokanee so Glacier Fresh Beer from Canada. Never had that before, but this almost like water, huh? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is good because I um, love the beers that Vince brought in, but after we rolled afterwards, it was <laughs> a bag of rocks in my stomach. Yeah. Story about Vince. So he um, contacted me via Facebook one day and was just like, AJ, there is this brewery down in Tampa, Florida. Literally, my backyard. Mm -hmm. It could throw a rock and hit the place. This is Vince from Show Your Roll we're talking about. Yes. Right. And and uh, he's like, there was these, you know, a few that I really, really want. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go there. I went there. I had no idea what to expect. <laughs> I was just like, I'd go to a store, pick up a few things, ship it off in the mail and send it to him. I went there, and there are thousands of people waiting in line for this <laughs> <laughs> special beer that I just, I was completely kind of taken back. I, you know, I'm not a real big into it or anything like that. You know, you guys are the connoisseurs, it seems like, but... It was uh, it was amazing to see, and they all gave us numbers. We'd have to wait in line, and there was only a certain amount of numbers given. Sounds like a show you roll presale. <laughs> <I was> just <laughs> <gonna> say, <laughs> sounds like a show you roll presale. They're doing it right. <laughs> That's um, cool. Chicken or the egg, right? Yeah, Jake. I've been getting a lot of a lot of questions about acai. Yeah, let's talk about that when we get right back from the commercial break. Okay, we'll be right back. BudoVideos.com, home of the world's largest selection of quality jujitsu kimonos. Show your roll, Storm, Tatami, Bull Terrier, Venom, and others. Styles from more than 30 top brands in stock and ready to ship. BudoVideos.com, you're only a click away from owning a new gi today.
Hi, I'm Rick Brown from LibertyStrengthTraining.com and I'm here for my friends at Kaizen Athletic to introduce to you the new Kaizen Athletic Power Mace. If you're a grappler, if you do jujitsu, if you need a strong grip, you need a power mace. Every time you pick it up, your hands are gripping this thick handle and you're getting a workout for your forearms, your elbows, your arms, and your hands. It's incredible. I'd like to show you a few of the movements that you can do with these four different sizes. The Kaizen Athletic Power Maces are available in 15, 20, 30, and 45 pounds and are available at budovideos.com. So AJ, you and I share a passion, oh, <laughs> but no. I think yours is a little bit stronger for acai. Yeah, you can. I think, I think my name from the Florida boy is probably gonna be changed to <laughs> Mr. Acai. <laughs> I eat so much acai, and I could eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and, and that's it. Tell me where you, how you first got into it. Jiu-jitsu, the the Sambazon stand mm -hmm. at uh, Pan Am's my first tournament. So I love it. Ever since then, I. I haven't started being so avid about making my own bowls and getting into my own bowls probably about a year ago. You know, I'd always go to, uh, you know, certain places that would say they sell it, like maybe a smoothie place. And they're like, oh, yeah, we have acai. I'm like, oh, I love acai. Let's, let's get a smoothie. And I, I think of it a lot like jujitsu. It's just like you want to keep playing with it. You want to keep finding different ways to make a certain bowl or, or you, you know, put things in a blender. You're like, ah, oh, this tastes good or this tastes better. I like to use this on my toppings. I used to, I like to put my granola on the bottom instead of on top. Just a lot of different ways to play with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I get a lot of questions about how I make my acai. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of places that make bowl, acai bowls. But, you know, personally speaking, it's garbage. <laughs> it is, it is garbage beyond. They only probably use one packet of acai. Mm -hmm. And the gauntlet has been thrown. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love acai so much I can't even explain it. <laughs> and you've learned some uh, some ways to prepare it from Carlinos, right? Yeah, he, he likes his a uh, he likes his more in a smoothie in a drink uh, fashion. I like mine in more of a bowl. I like thick scoop it, almost kinda crunching it, acai. Yep. And you go to a lot of acai places, it's like you're drinking out of a spoon, like it's soup, and I don't like that. And I think the acai was made to do just like it is in Brazil. It's just like a, a snack that you use with a spoon, and it's kind of like sorbet consistency. Yeah. Um, had the opportunity to go over with Luca Tala at his place the other day, right before we went to go see the uh, the new movie, um, the Batman movie. And uh, he, he likes to make his acai bowls a certain special way, and... He sticks to just actually. I can't tell him. I can't tell because okay. Before you get started, you went to his house and he doesn't have a special acai like shop somewhere, right? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I thought people were holding out on me. <laughs> no, he has just in his house. He has okay. We all use the Vitamix. It's a super sweet blender, and uh, I don't. If you don't, if you don't have a Vitamix, if you want to get into acai, invest in a Vitamix. It's probably about five hundred dollars, but there's so many things you can do with it, and um. I think that's probably one of the biggest problems that people run into when they're when they're making their acai is they're using the wrong blender. Um, this, the, you know, could probably work for Vitamix, but it uh, it makes the consistency really well. I use about three to four packets when I make a bowl. Um, it makes a good sized portion, but if you want to reduce that and just use two packets, I would recommend that. But just using one, you're not getting an acai bowl. You're getting just a bunch of different flavors and and all that sort of thing and. Um, 
So more stuff than acai? Yeah. More acai than stuff. More acai than liquid. I know right. a lot of people use, you know, apple juice or, you know, coconut water and things like that to put in to help make it blend better. I don't use any of it. I just use the, uh, I'll throw in maybe a couple of fruits, you know, select fruits that I like, blend that in, put the, the acai on top of that, blend that, and uh, and then I kind of get crazy with certain toppings. Right. I like hemp a lot. Hemp, the uh, hemp seeds. Mm. It's really good. And then... um what are the benefits of those? You know, I just kind of been reading a little bit into it. I think there's a all, just in terms of, you know, main benefit is the omegas, you know, the three six, right? Omega three and six. Um, then there's the the bee pollen. I haven't really kind of pinpointed what the in specific benefit of the bee pollen is, but it tastes really good. Mm. Um, and that's kind of a, a technique that I pulled out of bonsai bowl. They have a few bonsai bowl here in. In oh. Orange County. Costa Mesa, right? Yeah, there's Costa Mesa, and there's another one that most people don't know about unless you're walking by it is right there on Laguna Beach by Thousand Step Beach. Okay. And it's a really good facility. I think they're the best ASA place right now in Orange County. I know Samazon just opened up in Newport. Uh, even even Samazon is uh, a little held back on, on their ASA bowls, but I think Bonsai kind of gives you the full experience. Cool. Hopefully we'll make a, a video of you soon showing uh, some of your <laughs> acai. If we don't secrets. make it here, it's coming soon. I All promise. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So, Jake, guess what? What? We have more <laughs> black belts. All right. So we have five new black belts in Sweden. Uh, for everyone to know, they submitted this via email to us at the TWIBJJ at BudoVideos.com. So if anybody in the audience would like um, to submit some news to us, would like for us to discuss something on air, Please uh, submit it to that email address. And here's a picture of the black belts right now. Congratulations, guys. And in the picture, um, they got promoted on July 21st at the Checkmat Ultimate Gyms Summer Seminar in Urivala, Sweden. And uh, they were promoted by Leo Vera. And the people in the picture were um, Nicholas Borg, Jimmy Palander, Eric Borg, I wonder if they're related, Gunnar Blomqvist. Peter Blackwell, Tony Larson, and Frederick Johannesson. Congratulations, guys. Yeah, Absolutely. Congrats. Hope some of you guys make it out for the Worlds. That'd be awesome. Leo Vera ba Black Belts too, right? Yeah. And in other news, BJJ Hacks, uh, filmed by, and I'm going to slaughter his name, but I'm going to try, Joel Teague, um, filmed a Yuri Samoas video and he um, talked about what it takes to become a champion and I believe we have a clip here. I mean, you've been at a high level for a while. Uh, did you agree with a lot of things he said? Yeah, it was it was pretty interesting to see what all he had to say and, you know, a lot of that mindset is similar. I think one of the biggest things that, that, you know, out of being a high level is um, is the, the mental piece of it, having, right. um, you know, mental strength, mental mindset. On that note, let's watch a little bit of the clip right now. For being success in this sport, you, ju you gotta do your best. You gotta just do that for your life, you know? Like, every time that you're doing something that is not related to Jiu-Jitsu, you gotta think that someone else that you're gonna fight are, you know, doing better than you. So, the competition is not just in the match, but it's out for the preparation, you know? It's already a competition. Every so. Like like we said, you've you've been at the top of the heap for um, the competition at the Worlds and the Pans, um, and you and you felt that level. And it if you watch the whole video, it seems that he's saying that y you know if you're going to be at the top of the heat at the adult division in the brown and black belts, it's it, it's more or less a full time job. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I completely agree, and that's one of the reasons why I was working full time. And right prior, a couple months prior to the Pan Ams, I just said, you know what, I can't I can't do both. Right. I want to be at the top of my game. And I want to be doing this for a very long time, and so I pushed that aside and said, you know, let's go full fledged with with uh, jujitsu, and that's when I came out here. So, for you know, to give us kind of an idea of what it's like. So, before let's say the worlds, the last worlds, what was the average? What would give me a day in the life of what would the average training day be for you? I think it's different for every guy, but for me specifically, um, you know, I'd wake up. I'm a pretty early bird. You know, I fall asleep pretty. You know, early. Sometimes I'll get caught up where I'm looking at the computer and I'm staying up late. But right. I usually tend to wake up pretty early. I'll get an acai in me, um, whether make a bowl or just a, a drink, and then I go for a run. 
a couple miles, come back, feel good after that. Um, and then our training sessions are usually in the afternoon. Sometimes, you know, before the Pan Ams and before the Worlds, we were doing camp at 9 in the morning, so we'd had to, had to change it a little bit before that. But I think in order to be a champion, in order to be able to have a tough mindset, you have to do two a days. Not right. one for four hours, not one for f three hours, two a days. Whether that's a, a, a session in the morning or a session at, and a session at night or a session in the afternoon and a session in, at night, uh, you have to have two a days. If you want to be number one, if you, have to, if you want to have a, a tough mental game, you have to do two a days. Would you split it up, like focus one on technique, the other one more on sparring or drilling, or is it, you know? I, I just think same thing, same mm -hmm. thing twice a day. Who's your main training partner these days? Is it Kyron? Um, today, you know, we were both coming off a big injury. Um, most people didn't know I had tore my um, meniscus in the Pan Ams and had a partially torn ACL. Um, since then, I've been at the sports science lab that St. Pierre has been training in at and, and doing his rehab for his ACL. I've been strengthening it then, um, so I haven't been really training intensely lately, but just light training. But when I was training for the Pan Ams and for the Worlds, yeah, it was mainly with Ottavio. And uh, he's he's phenomenal. His intensity level is certainly what I really appreciated because that's what my background in was, right. you know, coming from wrestling. This is Otavio Souza, for you guys that don't know. Yeah, I know he just traveled to Brazil for the, um, how do you pronounce the name of that tournament? Copa Podio. Copa Podio. And um, you know, I know he didn't do as well as he'd like to, but, you know, just probably being there was a great experience for him. I know it was kind of a last minute. Right. And uh, we were trying to pull as many training partners as we could together for him to help get him prepared for it before we sent him off. And uh, it was just after the, the Moon Jial, so... I mean, that's another indication of the level that we're at now, right? Where, you know, trying to jump into an event at the last minute is an actual hindrance now. Would yeah. you agree? Uh, yeah, I can, I can agree with that. Yeah. So, um, I can believe I forgot what I was going to ask. Um, the Sports Science Institute that you, that you mentioned, um, tell us a little bit more about that. What kind of workouts do they have you doing? It, it's, m nothing's done with weights. Um, you know, it's all strength and conditioning Plyometrics. Um, we're doing water, res you know, water workouts in the water, resistance, um, and it's really for my legs and for my knees. It's been really activating a lot of other, you know, nerves and and muscle muscles that I haven't been really using a lot, and it's been strengthening all my outer muscles around my knee to to kind of get that better and and stronger, so I can be competing at the level that I should be competing at. Right. So you feel a difference? Oh, tremendously. Do you feel it when you're rolling or just moving around or? Yeah, my well, because of the you know the event that happened, it, it, my knee was very weak and it took a lot of time for me to to train off and had to take a lot of time off and wasn't training as intensely, so a lot of muscles around it became weak and so now it's just been a matter of strengthening it. Um, I wanted to avoid surgery completely. Right. Um, and I just heard a lot of mixed things about it and I you know gotten an MRI when when it. Uh, took it to the guys over there and they're saying you know basically yeah we can we can strengthen this without surgery and mm -hmm. um you know i was like i was like all for it and within a week i noticed a difference um i'm probably about 85 percent right now nice and in the world's i was probably about 45 percent <laughs> um well, that was another question I, I you were well injured going into the world's lot the yeah 12 worlds right yeah pretty bad and badly injured I couldn't even train. I had to stop training several times in the two months before. Um, I had got when I got in the MRI. It was done probably two, three weeks after the Pan Ams, and it came. Back. The only thing I wanted to know if it wasn't a torn ACL. It was partially torn, some minor, small tear in the ACL, but the mis mis meniscus was torn, and um, it's just one of those things that I think, in terms of what Yuri was saying, talking about, it's a mental toughness thing, you know. I didn't want to seem like I was being a girl and like, ah, oh, you know, I just came off a big win at Pan Ams. I don't want to do the Worlds or, you know, I'm too injured. I, I just sucked it up as much as I could, got in there and kind of fought as as well as I could. Did you, do you wish that you would have skipped the Worlds now? or No. No? Yeah. It's n it would always have been one of those things as what if. Yeah. Right. And uh, I think that's the one of the biggest things that haunts a lot of people is, you know, what if I was 18 again? What if I would have started jujitsu then? And that's what a lot of the voice came into me is, is kind of pushing work the you know corporate America aside and just staying with um, jiu-jitsu is I don't want to look back when I'm 35, 40 years old and say what if right. I'm at the adult level brown belt black belt level can be at the top of my game and I want to go gone home with it and that you just have to have a commitment level that's like no other 
every little thing in your life has to be completely revolved around it. So when you went into the worlds with that with that injury, did it change your strategy or the techniques that you went through? I had a tournament probably three weeks after the Pan Ams. And I thought, okay, I didn't know, two, I'm sorry, two weeks after the Pan Ams, I didn't know anything was damaged. I thought maybe I just pulled it or something, you know, nothing really intense. I had no idea this, the severity of it. And I did a, a tournament in Ohio, a submit, I think it was submission only, or no, it was a brown belt absolute. And it changed my game in the sense that I just was looking for the submission as fast as I could. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, I did, you know, I had three fights that tournament, three submissions. Um, but in terms of how it changed my mindset and how to compete, yeah, I was just looking for the submission as much as I could, avoiding the the wrapping bicep and avoiding the De La Hiva, anything that would kind of torque the knee. Was there any any point like you wish I wish I could have gone for this, but my knee? The 50-50 really messed me up. Oh, okay. Yeah, it it limited me a lot, and that's one of those things that kind of took me to the the direction of playing with the 50-50. I was just going to ask you that. Yeah. My d my discouragement from the Munjals was not being well equipped in the 50-50. And I think mainly because my athleticism was min you know, minimized due to my knee injury. But at the same time, you have eight minutes. If you don't submit a guy in eight minutes, in my mind, and this is conversations that I had with Master Carlos, you failed. Whether you win on points, you still failed. You know, you have eight minutes. And this is a brown belt level. You have ten minutes for a black belt level. If you can't submit a guy in eight, ten minutes, you know, something's wrong. So do you feel that way if eight, ten minutes and you haven't, even if you won, if you won by points, do you still feel that in a, at least small part that you failed? This is the mindset that I've, I've kind of adapted to in the last four months living here and staying with the guys and Master Carlos is impressed upon me. It's not up to the judges. It's not up, you know, you leave it in the hands of the judges, you can't be mad about it. You take the judges out of it, you know, you get, ch you get choked, there's no... There's no denying that. Right. And, um, yeah, I think it per and personally, and this is the way I feel, is just like I may win 25 to 0. If I don't get a choke, I'm upset. That's I cool. I had eight minutes to do it. Why didn't I do it? <laughs> you know? And I think that's kind of one of the things that we can maybe start to play with a little bit more in terms of developing our younger athletes is, you know, having them well-versed in every single position, but also doing what, jiu-jitsu is made to do is to submit our opponent yeah and how do you go go about training for that or sort of developing that mindset always looking for an attack always looking for a finish and that's certainly what the viewer wants to see too yeah right absolutely I was going to say that but it seemed a little self-serving <laughs> 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 well, I mean, everybody talks about how to get jiu-jitsu to the next level and that's making it a spectator sport which it's not now yeah. you know everybody wants to see the submission yep well, uh, we have a new episode of Rolled Up coming up soon, and uh, AJ, you're gonna rec you're gonna recognize uh, somebody in this video. This was filmed at Alliance New York City. Got a little preview clip here. Let's check it out. In competition, you bring the best of yourself and you go at it. But in preparation for the competition, you have to fall on your ass. You have to try new things. You have to, you know, you have to explore. And if you can't explore and experiment, you're not gonna go anywhere. You have that one game that kills everybody at the gym. You might run into the guy from that other gym who just knows how to kill it. Or you're not gonna stop, you know? So you, you experiment, you break down things, you know, your training partner, who doesn't normally kick your ass, you allow him to do stuff so that you can learn from it, you know? And I think that's the worst thing. Unfortunately, you have a lot of that in jiu-jitsu, but I think that's one of the essential things that a teacher and instructor must get rid of in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So we had a great time filming that episode with Babs, Sinistro and Fabio Clemente, uh, great bunch of guys there. And uh, you've com com uh, competed against Sinistro a couple of times, did you? Three, to <laughs> be exact, but who's counting? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more with, with that. And I saw the intro to that clip, and I saw when you guys released it, and I couldn't agree more. Right. There is 
no way in in, in in God's green earth that you could possibly develop growth or or adapt to new things if you don't fall on your butt. And I fell on my butt in my purple belt years, and, and that's when I faced an Easter actually twice, one in the Pan Ams and second in the, the Mundials, both in the quarterfinals. And the sad part about it that we competed each other in the quarterfinals is that only one of us is placing. And, you know, we're only... I mean, at that level, you know, it's it's great to walk around with you know with a medal and that sort of thing. Certainly, medals don't make up the sport, but it's it's great to you know bring those back to your family and your your crew. That recognition is always nice, right? Yeah, but it was it was f- completely frustrating. And and one of the things that I took back from that is that it shed some light onto me in terms of my my jujitsu game. After those two losses, I'm pretty sure I didn't train anything else except for guard. Mm. Right. And both times that Sinistra beat me, he pulled guard first. Uh-huh. And in the Pan Ams, I pulled guard first. Right. And I, it just, you know, kind of lacing back into what he was talking about. It's just you have to develop every single aspect of your game. You can't be strong in one position and weak in another. You know, it's just like a chain. If you have one weak link, it's going to break somewhere. If somebody has a, a good, you know, sense of, of certain position and, and, you know, they get you in that situation you could be beat because of it or you could you know potentially be submitted because of it and you have to fall you have to, in order to win, win big championships in order to to capitalize on on you know a high level of success you have to fall you have to experience defeat you have to experience it in some sort of way whether it's on the mat it's in other areas of your life you have to experience it because it's going to certainly make you grow because of it yeah, it's a really good episode, premiering August 6th. A couple more products I'd like to talk about before we head to the mats. The first one is Gymnastica Naturale. Have you guys ever trained in Alvaro, Mor- Mor- Alvaro Romano's Gymnastica Naturale? No. I've been aware of it for, for a while. I've been interested in it, but it's just never come together for me. He's an old-school Gracie student, trained with Hickson and uh, and Holes. It's, uh, this is... He's released a few DVDs up to now, but never has he put his whole system out. This is an eight DVD wow. set, all on basically yoga for jujitsu. They're That's all incredible. solitary exercises. Mm. I did a private with him one time. It was incredible. Um, this will get you in shape. It's pretty tough, huh? Yeah. That's awesome. This is eight DVDs for eighty bucks. It's a really good deal. And it's broken down by it looks like by category or. Yeah, I'll run through them real quick. First steps: classic, stretching, circuit training, cardio power then there's a disc for senior citizens another one for wow. kids really <laughs> organized huh yeah yeah and, and really good stuff so if you want something to do when you don't have a training partner i'd recommend gymnastica natural it's available on budovideos.com another thing that came uh, available today was a pre-order for the honey badger rash guard by tatami fightwear i think we have a picture of it here these are available in limited quantities and uh, available in long sleeve all sizes Get them while they last on budovideos.com. All right, guys. Should we head to the mats? Let's, Let's do it. All right. We'll be right back, guys. Let me tell you something about not caring. It'll get you in places you don't want to be. Alone, cold-hearted, fearless. It will break you down into the bottom is all you have. Funny thing about the bottom is, there's only one direction left to go. Videos.com, home of the world's largest selection of quality jujitsu kimonos. Show your roll, Storm, Tatami, Bull Terrier, Venom, and others. Styles from more than 30 top brands in stock and ready to ship. Budovideos.com, you're only a click away from owning a new gi today.
Hi, I'm Rick Brown from LibertyStrengthTraining.com and I'm here for my friends at Kaizen Athletic to introduce to you the new Kaizen Athletic Power Mace. If you're a grappler, if you do jujitsu, if you need a strong grip, you need a power mace. Every time you pick it up, your hands are gripping this thick handle and you're getting a workout for your forearms, your elbows, your arms, and your hands. It's incredible. I'd like to show you a few of the movements that you can do with these four different sizes. The Kaizen Athletic Power Maces are available in 15, 20, 30, and 45 pounds and are available at budovideos.com. So one of the things that I like to establish first when I attack a single leg is my grips. Um, and it's first is gonna be here and here. And obviously the guy's not gonna give it to us right away like this. So a lot of the time it's a hand fight, maybe fighting up here, switching here. But in the end, end result, I wanna have both hands on the grip at the top of the wrist. And I wanna have my wrist rotating down and putting the weight down on, towards the mat. It really puts him in an uncomfortable position and it also allows me to be able to maneuver him however I want him to, to go. Whether I want him to go this way or I want him to go this way or even backwards and forward. So wrist control, rolling the wrist on both ways. When I attack a single leg, I have to have a lead leg established. You have your left leg or your right leg. You know, we can't do a single leg like this. We have to have a lead leg established. My lead leg is my left leg. So if my left leg is leading, that means for me to be able to attack a single leg, I have to attack his back leg. I have to mirror the same side that I'm attacking. So if I'm leading with this leg, I have to have this leg in front. If I want to attack a single leg with the, to this leg, I have to be using this leg. So what happens when he has that leg backwards? Well, I have both wrist control. I need to, to step, move him around to be able to bring this leg forward. So what I do is I don't take a step back and pull this forward. It's not that easy. All he will do is move forward just like he did. So I'm going to move to the side and take a big step to the right opposite of my lead leg and yank his leg forward. Now I have the leg that I wanted to attack forward. I can change my level, bring my knee right back to his, his foot here, and I swing this arm out and hook this leg at the same time. Now it's very important that I keep my head up right in his floating rib and I don't let him get opportunity to stuff my head down because if he stuffs my head down, I'm not going to be able to finish the technique. I keep my head super tight right in the floating rib, not giving him any room to, mo to move my head. And I have this hook here. I have it just laced right above the knee and I'm keeping this arm away. It's very important to keep this arm away when I have both knees, when I have one knee on the mat and the other leg on the mat because if I don't, if I attack the leg just like this, Without holding that leg, he can defend. And this is kind of an Easter egg for you guys. When he attacks this leg, go ahead. And he doesn't have this arm, it's super easy for me to defend because all I need is a wizard and a wrist. If he's not voiding this hand out and I have an opportunity to play with it, he's not going to be able to finish a single leg on me because all I need is this wrist and this wizard. And when he goes to move or when he goes to make a movement, I just bring my leg down, I lift up on the wrist that he wasn't controlling my hand with. So when I teach guys the single leg, I teach them it's very important to keep this hand away. When I have the, 
the, the leg on the ground before I pick it up. Now that I have this leg and I have my head in the right position, I can drive off the mat and bring the leg up in the air. Now I can release this because for, it be, for him to be able to finish, it's going to be a lot tougher now that I have the leg up as opposed to when I had the leg on the mat. So in wrestling, I kind of coined this phrase as being what's called the sweet spot. Mainly the sweet spot because there's a plethora of takedowns I can go from this position. So one more time. Right here is the sweet spot. I have the leg in between my legs, my knees are pinched together, my head in the right spot, butterfly grip on my arms, and now I'm gonna step over for a finish. I'm gonna step over, but before I step over, I'm like uppercutting and keeping this leg super tight. Now I, I can control the knee above, right above the knee, step over, and I lower my, my stance. And I'm gonna wrap at the ankle. When I wrap at the ankle, I'm wrapping at my elbow, the crook of my elbow, and I'm grabbing my own lapel. This is, is, is gonna create and to be very uncomfortable when I stand up. So when I stand up, I'm just bringing my chest up and now he's not in, in a happy position. So he's gonna post to keep himself balanced. He maybe grab my own lapel, he may post on my shoulder. I just look at it as awesome. I can't wait to take this guy down. So I can even reinforce and, and feed my own lapel and make it super tight, but there's no space for his ankle to move, for him to rotate. If he wants to fly out, do a crazy kick, I have my, his leg controlled, so either way, he's, he's gonna be taken down. Most guys will do this, where they post the arm up and try to keep them balanced. All I'm gonna do is gonna take my free hand, make this little crook right here with my fingers, and post right at the elbow, and lift, elevate his arm up and away. And I keep pushing until he goes to the mat. In wrestling, most guys will fall to all fours. In jiu-jitsu, what most guys will do, they'll either A, stay here and try to fight it, or B, go to the mat. If they stay here and try to fight it, I simply just sweep his foot, his back foot, and it'll go right to his back. Or, right away, he will go to his back already, just like this. He'll turn to his back. Turn to your back. Oh, he'll turn just like that. I still have the ankle. So it's very, it's, it's a very dominant position for me. I'm gonna maintain control of his knee and the hand that was on his ankle is gonna come to the same side inside the leg and I'm gonna control his knee and push it this way. Notice my hip power when I was here, I used my hip to push his leg over. So here, pop my hip a little bit and go right to the knee on belly. So depending on the ref, you may get, you'll certainly get two points for the takedown Possibly two, three points for the pass, and then two points for the knee and belly. One more time. So I'm maybe hand fighting up here. I can, I can always can guarantee one grip first. It's, it's a given. To be able to get the second grip, most of the time it's a fight. So maybe I post here, he starts to grab my own, and I just rotate my wrist out, and I push his arms down. Again, he's leading with the leg. He's not leading with the leg that I want, so I have to move him away, step to the side, and yank. When I step to the side and yank, I'm pushing this arm away, stepping, and hooking. Keeping this arm away until I elevate the leg up, load it up, sweet spot, and finish. Sometimes that happens too, where the guy will get so Uncomfortable, it will be so uncomfortable for him, he'll fall right away. I believe there was a match in the Pan Ams as a purple belt where I had the leg just like this and I brought it up and when I went to bring it up, he just fell just like that and it'll happen. So just keep control of the knee, hit power and move right past the guard. One more time without talking. And that's your singles leg technique of the week. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Well, thank you, AJ, for the great single leg. That thank was you. awesome.
Thank you. We're going to have to drill that. And thank you for tuning in to watch another episode of This Week in BJJ. We'll be back again next week. Sean Williams will be here, and also along with our special guest, Eddie Bravo. Hope to see you again next week. That concludes this installment of This Week in BJJ. Subscribe on iTunes, watch and review past episodes, and then be sure to join us again next Friday night, right here for another live edition of This Week in BJJ.